Hi everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I'm with Humanist Learning Systems. I'm also a, a board member for the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. My co-host today is Elizabeth. Hi everyone, Elizabeth Castillo. I'm an assistant professor at Arizona State University and, and I'm also a board member of IHMA. Thank you so much for joining us today. So this is our Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. And we, uh, we do this to try and provide practical how-to information for working professionals. Today, we have Dr. Valicia Dunbar. She is a strategically oriented leader, mentor, coach, and manager uh, who has worked with public agencies, nonprofits, and for-profit businesses. And she does uh, leadership coaching in particular. And we are very excited to have her on today to help us talk about leadership in crisis. Dr. Dunbar. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me today. So I am really passionate about how we can effectively lead in today's current environment. Should I go ahead and start the slide? Yeah, go ahead. Well, and one of the things that I'm absolutely passionate about, click on that for a second, there we go. It's this concept of high reliability leadership. And we're gonna focus on that because there's some prerequisite sort of context that we need to understand when we talk about today's environment of leadership and that when we lead in today's world and in this global economy that is highly engaged, we are talking about crisis situations that are pretty much normal. Every day is an opportunity for a new crisis to arise whether it was expected or not expected. Crisis is normal in these environments. Power is less relevant. Authority is evenly distributed and responsibility is shared. So in the past context of leadership, we had one authority person who was always that person that made the decisions, who had his independent team around him and the team distributed decisions for the group. That is shifting because our response time has been shortened. So the mitigating factors of crisis leadership involve flexible decision-making structures. Now we have managerial leaders who are empowered to make decisions based on the context of their environment and the situation at hand. They have to be self-aware, they have to understand how they make decisions when in a crisis and when they're not in a crisis and how those decisions change. They must trust themselves and others because when you're shifting um, decision making and authority to other team members across the organization, you have to believe that they will make the right decision. And that comes through practice and training and this understanding, this concept of uh, social equity, social investment in each other. They are mindful of each other. They respect each other's presence and their uh, 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 role in the workplace. And it's the simple concept of I see you and I appreciate you, your being here. And that's uh, a true humanistic belief and a humanistic principle, I think. The presence of mind is also a part of what we call perception. So this perceptive kind of thinking is not just having the intelligence or the knowledge or awareness alone is how do you behave when you apply it or how are you perceived uh, when you apply your intelligence to a certain situation or context. So it matters more so how you work within groups and organizations um, than whether you bring a certain trait or skill set to the table. So I love this slide because it's a quick and easy um, slide that a lot of people can um, relate to. So I ask the question often, which one of these leaders um, uh, is more like you when you're working, at, working within an environment or in an organization? My other question is, which one do you think would be the more effective leader? Which one do you think would be the less effective leader? And when I'm talking about effective leadership, I mean one who instills confidence in others in a crisis, um, who uh, distributes their leadership and who shares their leadership, as opposed to the other who would uh, more than likely create a new situation of crisis by causing stress and anxiety in others. The answer is that it could be either. 
either of these individuals based on their organizational type, based on the context of the situation, can become an effective leader when they apply certain uh, mitigating factors or skills. They have to be highly self-aware. They have to understand how they work with each other prior to a crisis and how each other's certain thinking skills, critical thinking skills, um, how they are uh, trustworthy and compassionate towards others in crisis, and how they deal with personal responsibility. And these are the, the, the uh, context of the humanistic management approach. So the confidence factors, I'm really uh, just very excited about how confidence improves a person's ability to perform, a person's ability to be productive in, in our environment, and a person's ability to relate and make decisions that are, are more than likely uh, going to bring, out, bring about the outcomes that they wish. So it's all about social equity when you're talking about confidence and the ability to influence others. Um, it's an interdependent relationship, the leader and the follower or vice versa, because now we're working in environments where everyone has the opportunity to lead and a leader has to understand when to step down and let that person who has more experience with the situation, more of a crisis response uh, uh, intuitive ability uh, to be effective in those situations, they are the ones who actually have the authority and the decision making in those contexts. These individuals are often very charismatic because they can shift between different environments and work with many kinds of people and many kinds of personalities. And, in, and it takes confidence to have that kind of ability to lean forward and to apply yourself in any kind of social setting or social environment or crisis environment or crisis setting. So they're also um, very in tune to different applications of how they apply intelligence. Um, they're very in tune to their own emotions as well as the emotions of others. And of course, they are uh, automatically socially engaging because of this. And they're able to think through problems and make decisions on their own and adapt. Um, one of the big uh, transferences of leadership now is the adaptability quotient. How can you adapt in different environments? Um, they learn and encourage, and encourage others to learn without, without um, punitive responses. And this is the empowering, empowering side of a crisis leader, that before, leaders, uh, before crisis happens, everyone understands that they're learning um, in advance of crisis situations. They're learning through these high tempo environments and they're allowed to uh, uh, apply their certain experiences and knowledge, and knowledge uh, to meet the need at hand. Um, they're also in tune to uh, others' emotional experiences, and they're very uh, comfortable with understanding that their decision-making is going to create the outcome that they want. Now, the thing about how we're creating change in, in leadership uh, situations is what we call high-touch leaders. So, Technology is the big focus now, increasing technology. Technology is, is uh, influencing how all of us respond and technology is making us more engaged. And we also have stakeholders that are our traditional stakeholders, but also stakeholders that we are unaware of. They're out there, they know us, they follow us, but we have no idea who these stakeholders are. So a leader, when putting into practice these kind of crisis thinking contexts, has to have a certain measure of how often am I involved in um, communication through technology versus how often I'm involved in face-to-face -face positive one-on-one -on -one interaction with people, high-touch situations. And a good way to look at that is every day, just look and see how often you're emailing, tweeting, uh, uh, texting versus conversations, having conversations and having face-to-face -face engagement to build those social skills. And so when you put it in action, confidence and a confident mindset matters when you're in crisis leadership situations. It is the difference between whether you are successfully leading through crisis, you're transferring uh, knowledge, you're transferring leadership, you are working across the organization and working across groups, versus if you're that kind of leader who in a crisis increases stress, increases anxiety, and creates a, a, a totally different situation of how crisis response is, is handled.
So create those relationships, eliminate self-doubt, be confident in your decision-making that comes through practice, eliminate self-judgment and judgment of others, allow them to make mistakes, empower them to make those mistakes, and monitor um, how you limit others based on whether their approach is, you know, a Napoleon type style of management or a sort of um, uh, Mr. Rogers style of management. Be careful how you perceive those um, leaders because they have an opportunity to show through action that they can shift and adjust in different situations. And even when you're not 100% sure, I always say, um, just act so that you're creating that momentum to create different a difference and to create change, but be open to the responses and the feedback that you receive. And that is my presentation. Wonderful. So I have a few questions. <laughs> yeah, Generally, how absolutely. we work this is that Elizabeth and I um, ask you some questions and then we open it up to everybody else. Um, so there's a couple of things you mentioned through this that kind of struck me. The first one was that the creation of trust in advance of a crisis goes a long way to allowing people to relax into handling. To me, that translates into if I trust my colleagues, I'm more relaxed in a crisis and less panicked in a crisis. And that transfers into a more confident leadership style as we deal with the the crisis am i was i right in understanding you're absolutely right yes yes and that also when it when the leader is demonstrating that they're confident and they have belief or self-belief in themselves that also translates in other people in other managerial leaders in other people within teams with throughout the organization it becomes very transparent what kind of leader this person is and what they bring to the table the, the second thing that stuck out to me is you said this is not a punitive approach, that when a crisis occurs, um, that a, a competent leader does not take a punitive approach at all. Can you expand on that? Yes, fear is one of the biggest um, sort of critical uh, fault, you know, fault feels when it comes to empowering another person to learn and to grow and to develop the kind of um, independent decision making and, and authoritative sort of approach to um, handling crises. So when a, a leader is one that is constantly um, reprimanding rather than teaching and learning and sort of retraining and reframing um, situations, that fear that comes out of, of that kind of approach paralyzes the individual, creates that stress that we want to stay away from, creates that anxiety that we want to stay away from, and we want to make sure that um, everybody has a stake in the organization's approach to crisis response and crisis leadership. So. We wanna make sure that that person feels that they can come and be proactive and move forward with um, their relationships with that leader. And it's, it's that social equity again to build that, um, you know, that power structure. So for aspiring leaders, um, it sounds like a, a lot of the stuff has to be done ideally before we get into crisis so that the, the relationships are in place th that we can then rely on as a team when we're in crisis, what are three things people can practice on their own as a leader um, that would help them so when they move into crisis, they've established those relationships? What are the three main things people should be doing? The three main, main things that they should be doing is first and foremost is to have a very good understanding of their own crisis response of who they are when they're under stress or when they're under anxiety, how they respond. Because how they respond and how people perceive that response is going to dictate um, how everything else falls into action. So be very cognizant of if you're the kind of person who is, you know, if you're a panicker, <laughs> you know, if you're a person that is calm, if you're a person that immediately uh, just withdraws from the situation and pretends that it's not there, that is the worst thing that you can do. And that happens because that's just some people that is their um, 
learned kind of inherent mindset about stress. They, you know, and crisis is a stress response. First is to understand how you, how you deal with stress and put into, into place steps, whether it's mindfulness behavior, whether it's meditation, whether it's, um, uh, you know, assessments and training to help you work through that kind of behavior, learn that first. Secondly, once you understand who you are as a person and how you respond, learn three steps or not even three steps, learn your core approaches to communicating out to others what you need in order to be effective, what you need from them. So create that relationship, create that alliance where everyone is building each other up in those environments and everyone knows the other's sort of soft spot or weak spot so that you can both respond effectively. And the third thing I would say is have your alliances uh, in place prior to you know, any sort of crisis situation, have your policies in place, if it's a, if it's a broader structural sort of thing, if it's a team uh, sort of response, make sure that there are some policies that are already in place that will easily take some questions and decisions off the table and you can move into really addressing the core issues. That's really, really helpful. I think just know yourself first is like, no one ever says that, right? But it's, it's critical. Okay, so the second question I have is on a similar line. If I am an employee and I have a manager who is otherwise pretty good, but their stress response is not good at all. Yeah. What are the ways that, what are a couple of things I can do to help manage up and help them get through their crisis without allowing their, say, less than ideal crisis response negatively impact the workflow? <laughs> well, th th what I would say is to have a partner in place for that person, um, someone who can uh, mentor that person um, and help that person to understand what is co the you know correct responses versus um, uh, more hurtful or harmful responses. So throughout the, the organization, there isn't a start and stop period for you know, learning through crisis. What you want to do is just make it um, a habit, a uh, part of the process, part of the policy where that person is receiving coaching or that person is, has a mentor or a partner within the same department who can balance and offset that crisis response. And to make sure that their measures attached to it, that there are certain measurables to show that they're moving through and um, getting out of what I would call, you know, sort of that um, resting space of stress, what they're accustomed to, moving into a different mindset, a different perspective that they can use um, moving forward to create better crisis response situations. And mindfulness is a great one. Meditation is a great one. Um, it's just a developing a practice and a habit that is more positive than negative. Great. Um, kind of what I was thinking was, wow, how cool would it be to work in an organization where everyone had a co-mentor, right? Where you mentored each other through things, like everyone was paired up with someone else um, to help them through whatever, because it doesn't even require crisis for things to have be difficult, but to have everyone have a mentor all up and down the organization would be, I don't know if it's feasible, but that would be cool. <laughs> well, even if it's informal, it's feasible. Yeah. So, it, you know, if you're, um, if you're, your social, ec social equity is high and you recognize this in a person without them saying it, um, because you will pick it, pick up on it with just tiny things like uh, deadlines, you know, you'll, you'll start to see what that looks like. So the leaders within the organization, again, it's more of a horizontal leadership structure where managers are leading, um, team members are leading, someone within that organization um, should be empowered. And that's part of that culture of crisis is everyone feels that they have uh, the authority and the power to support and build, you know, uh, positive crisis behaviors in other people to develop their whole entire team and organization. Yeah, you, the, what you're describing is it would be great, right? It's this this ideal of collaborative, supportive workplace, so that when a crisis happens, it's dealt with 
in a in a productive way as opposed to you know a, a really damaging way for the individuals involved um yes elizabeth do you have any questions that you want to ask before we open up to everybody else and if you have questions ask them in the the chat room um, yeah, I, I'm going to wait for my questions until we, because we are starting to get a little um, airplane runway of questions. So I'd like to go ahead and get to the, the audiences. And because we have a nice intimate size, I'm going to go ahead and unmute people as, you're, as the question comes up. Um, so Alan asked, um, how effective is telling someone be confident or don't have doubt? Um, so Alan, let me unmute you so you can ask directly to Dr. Valicia. Yeah, thank you. What I mean is that sometimes uh, when people have fear or doubt or panic, it is not a rational process. And my question is whether it is always the only way to tell somebody that you should not have or this is not uh, the best way. This is my question. I'm not sure of the question. The question is, is, um, is there another way? The question is, you have, sometimes you have to experience something. Sometimes you have to have self-reflection and self-improvement. And another way is you teach somebody, you tell, you should not have doubt. Don't be doubtful, be confident, be positive. The, I'm just questioning, is it something effective? Did, did you see it work in uh, telling some people and they can do it? Oh, abs absolutely, every day, every day. So that comes through um, practice. So what you have to do is empower that person with small projects, small um, uh, tests of their confidence so that they can understand and learn that once they have that experience behind them, once they take that first step, it's always about action. You know, um, people think confidence is kind of something that rests. It really is not a resting state. It's an active state. Um, so you build confidence through just taking each and every small step that you need until you get to a space of trusting yourself. Um, it starts with self-belief and then that self-belief um, moves into trust. And then there's also this element of optimism. You must at all times believe or have um, a positive uh, aspect on what the outcomes will look like. Even if the outcomes aren't what you expected, the opportunity to learn from those outcomes is still a positive um, um, aspect. So that's the resiliency part as well um, that comes from it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, can you stop sharing the screen as we go into the next question? And um, yeah, so I will move on now to um, Jennifer and I'll ask the question and then I'll um, unmute Jennifer so that she, um, she can weigh in too. But um, Jennifer says, you mentioned something about individuals learned behavior mindset. Faculty I worked with have debated whether crisis change leadership is more an innate quality, something developed through experience and or something developed through education. Um, can you share your thoughts? Um, Jennifer, I'm unmuting you so you can, is that what the essence of your question? Uh, she might have left. So um, what would you say then about um, whether it can be learned or whether it's um, an innate quality? It is actually both. It is both. Um, there are some people who just respond to crisis events very well, um, and that's just who they are. They are natural, um, you know, they're naturally gifted in that way. Um, they can instinctively sense crisis. They can instinctively uh, sort through the, you know, what the core issues are and, and immediately respond. Um, I was never that person, unfortunately, so I had to learn it. So there's that component of learning it. And again, learning it is, is starting with just understanding who you are and why you, why you respond the way that you do. Why, are you, you know, why do you stress out first? <laughs> and then going into this, uh, these areas where you can practice and start building those beliefs that you can move past and you can uh, effectively manage. And it's um, one model that I would say is the best model right now is the high reliability leadership models where it is, uh, where it focuses on team members um, 
working together to understand how to distribute leadership, how to distribute authority, uh, and deferring to who is the expert in the room. And the expert in the room may not have the most, the highest position or the uh, most authority, but they're the expert in that one area of knowledge or expertise. And so you learn from that person and it shifts all the time. It shifts with every situation, every opportunity. And for somebody wanting to learn more about this high reliability leadership model, um, what resources might you suggest for that? The best models right now are within the healthcare industry. And the Joint Commission has several studies out that I can, I can share, share some of those studies and some of the information with you about the Joint Commission. But their concern um, was that, uh, you know, patients, I, you know, I hate saying this, patients were, there were too many people dying um, in hospitals. Um, there, were prevent, there was a high percentage of preventable deaths. Mm -hmm. So people were dying in hospitals when they should not die in hospitals. And it's an enormously sad number. And what they realized was that there was just this gap in, um, and similar for the military, of rank and file, of, of people who had rank and file making decisions when the person who was the expert in the room um, was set aside or not referred to because they weren't, you know, they didn't have that position of authority. So now the model is that whoever has the most expertise in the room, whoever can make the best decision in the room who has that experience makes the decision. And it's also about um, putting in place preventive safeguards um, where everyone, whether they are um, responsible for, for a certain um, practice or not, will report on any discrepancies that they see in process and procedures, no matter who it is and that they understand that they will not be punished or penalized for stepping out. Before they were considered, you know, we're step, you're stepping out of your lane. Now it's perfectly acceptable for you to do that because you learn from it. Okay, thank you so much. That's super helpful. And yeah, if you could sh um, share the resources and we can send them out to everybody because I think that's exactly the type of um, information that this group is looking for is the practical how-tos in a real world setting, right? Um, Georgia, I'm going to, uh, so our, I'm going to unmute her. Um, sh she wants to know um, the risk about being too horizontal is to be all over the place. Um, let me in unmute her, find her so she can weigh in on that. Jo Georgia, do you want to say something about that? Oh, yeah. Here we go. We, we're studying quantum leadership right now. And, um, and something that was, so, you know, you have to be self-aware, like, it, it kind of goes in the line of what you were saying, but something, so we're, many of the benefit corporations are trying this horizontal type of attitude and like it's working to a certain extent and something that was really fun and I've been invited to one and I've already seen the second one is that they have like failure parties. And since this is Italy, they have failure parties with the Prosecco. <laughs> so that they always works. <laughs> And um, so, you know, they have these things. So what you were saying, it kind of creates a safe place where you're going to celebrate failure so you can learn something from it. Absolutely. And you have all these high reliability qualities to them. The only thing is that when, they're, when you become like too mindful or whatever, like some of these leaders are kind of like the Branson model to a certain extent, but like they're a little bit all over the place. So then it's very hard to get them focused on something. And one of these benefit corporations has like a co-CEO thing going. Mm -hmm. You have one guy who's all over the place and he's wonderful. And then the other guy who's super serious, like engineer type. And they balance each other out perfectly. So I just, but to have a good leadership model as a whole, I'm just wondering where you draw that line. I don't know if you have suggestions to like make it more effective. Well, you draw the line, so th there's still structure. So structure is still required. And you're not always floating back and forth between the lines. You're only doing that when there is an impending um, uh, need to do so. So everyone has sort of their uh, drawn out uh, you know, areas of expertise, of policy, you know, practices, what have you. It only um, needs to happen when you have an impending situation where you must step out of that line. So everything should already have a structure around it. 
and then you have permission to break that structure when necessary. So everyone shouldn't be happily running around, you know, and, and touching into areas and zones and, and interfering with practices that are unrelated to their core um, areas. Only when they recognize that there is an immediate, immediate need to step out of that zone and to, uh, uh, you know, participate and support the, you know, the prevention of crisis in another area is when they should be should be doing that. So there should still be some sort of structure in place. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, no, I think that's useful. Okay. You're muted, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I just unmuted um, Jennifer. I wanted to let you know uh, she typed in that she is here. So Jennifer, do you want to weigh in and see if that if, if Dr. V answered your question? Hmm. Okay, well, we'll come back to her. Um, and then one question that we had was from a BW. Do you have any recommendations for managing up? And um, they say, as a, an older former leader, to work as a subordinate for a younger person, wanting the younger person to be successful. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, you're, you were muted. Okay, so, sorry about that. Um, so uh, managing up, it, the question was um, for an older person who is being managed by a younger person, how do you manage up in terms of transferring your knowledge and skills to them? Is that is that the question? Okay. okay. So uh, with that, that's, again, that is going back into building social equity. You know, that is um, an opportunity to transfer your knowledge and skills to this person who is um, lacking in certain areas or skill sets that you are a master in. So that is something that we should all do on a continuous basis. Not managing up is just asking that person, especially if they're a manager and they're young and they may be, may be a little um, anxious or nervous about being in that position, just have that conversation with them about how can I help you? Like that's just an, the everyday building the social equity aspect of what you're doing. And it goes both ways and they will appreciate that. And it's, it's again, it's, it's um, uh, acknowledging that you see them and you appreciate them um, and that you respect them by asking those questions and engaging them in that way. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and if anybody else has any questions, feel free to type them in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask a couple that are on my mind. Um, so if you work for a culture, uh, an organization that culture does, does not have this culture of high reliability leadership, and you do not have necessarily positional power within the um, organization, like you're not um, top of the food chain, what interventions could I make as a mid-level person, say, to try to shift the culture and orient them towards this high reliability leadership model? So one thing that, I, that has been effective, and, and I've seen this in other people who are, you know, within organizations that um, for some reason they perceive that their, their opinions uh, um, uh, would not be accepted or valued, is to start to create within yourself. So this is where, you know, leadership confidence comes in is when you start to create for yourself that channel of communication um, that would allow you to get your messaging out. And that even if you started a week, uh, a weekly lunch and learn like this one, or uh, put yourself up to present or suggest a research topic, whatever avenues your organization currently has, use them. If they don't have them, then go ahead and pitch it. So if the trust isn't there first yet, I would say start with that first. So if you're feeling uncomfortable or anxious, that means that something else is missing, that you still have to build the relationship. So go with that first and sort of 
with the mindset of later on, once you can bring up the issue of, uh, of wanting to lead in a different way, until then, first start with just building the relationships that you need to build. And, and it's just, just have that confidence and just lean forward, lean into it and um, ask for a meeting, ask questions, put yourself out there. And that, that does take some risk, but it'll take away that anxiety that you feel about leading. And that ties into one of the last takeaways on your slide is even when you're not feeling confident, act, do something. Ab absolutely. Right, that's how we build confidence. Um, so thank you. Um, Bernita has a, a question. I'm gonna read it and Bernita, I'm gonna unmute you. So, or I don't know if she's calling in, but anyways, how to deal with a newcomer who has become successful somewhere else, but they don't necessarily have the background in the current context. How do you deal with them? Yeah. Again, it's going, so yeah, it's going back to, um, being mindful again just seeing them just letting them know acknowledging um, them and letting them know that you see them you appreciate them and you respect them and then having a conversation around that appreciation and that belief so don't um don't over don't overthink yourself sort of is what i'm trying to say um look at it through the lens of the other person so there's this research you know on um you know people styles and, and how to um, create or, or, or how to masterfully communicate with someone else using their um, communication style and their language um, to become effective, more effective at communicating with them. So approach them with their that what you see in them as having value. There's there's nothing wrong with that. And then out of that. Uh, look at it as an opportunity to start building that social equity again and creating this kind of conversation that you want with them if they've been successful elsewhere but they're you know coming into this new organization and uh it may feel it may not feel positive for example or it may feel negative or it may feel threatening again work on building your self-awareness and working with that person to see where you two both have value and start the conversation there Mm -hmm. did, that, did I answer that? Yeah, I think that was great. Can, Thank you. Can I ask uh, a follow up? Sure. So a lot of what you're talking about sounds to me like the advice you give for couples counseling, right? Like you don't talk about how you talk in the moment. You, you do that outside of the crisis and reset the relationship and have the conversation about appreciation and respect and all of that because you have to build that not in crisis, but outside of crisis so that the relationship is strong enough in the crisis to manage the crisis, whatever that is in an interpersonal relationship. It's the same, it sounds like you're talking about the same thing in the workplace as well. Well, I haven't been to couples counseling, but <laughs> I will say that it's about it's it's about just what you're about the humanistic approach to you know working together and and connecting with people and collaborating is that you first want to um establish some some sort of synergy with the person and um if you're already in your mindset about who they are who you think going back to napoleon and, and mr rogers um both of those images are totally different in terms of how they manage how you think that they will manage how they may respond whatever but in order to be effective it's about how they relate to you the other person in the room uh, and once you understand that it's really about more so about the other person um when it comes to how effective you can be in managing them and leading them uh then you can start to build you know that linkage and that effectiveness as a team you have to you have to appreciate them for you, you can't start without appreciating that other person uh, first right so like doing some personal appreciative inquiry into the other person yes like to set up the relationship on a good footing yes yes and um, then a couple of questions that we had when people um, registered were, uh, what about why the crisis context? Um, does this only, can, does this only have, have to have be in a crisis? And um, Elena, I'm going to unmute you. You're one of the persons that um, 
uh, uh, put this in there. So if you want to weigh in more, um, you might have to unmute yourself because it's not letting me. But um, so is this only for crisis or does this have to be um, for, could it be used in other times too? Yeah, it's throughout the continuum of building the relationship and preparing the organization to uh, to have a preventive mindset about um, crisis leadership. So it's the 360, a full contextual approach to leading um, during normal operating environments and crisis operating environments. And it starts during the normal, everyday, um, ongoing uh, you know, relationship building and managing. Uh, but nowadays, that crisis environment is becoming normal, is what I'm saying. So you always have to be aware that at any moment, um, within the organization or outside of the organization, you're going to have to be flexible and adaptable at all times. So just have those resources, you know, built up um, uh, in advance. Okay. Um, and what would you say in terms of organizations building their leadership development capacity? Um, so you had talked about this being an opportunity and that there were going to be more, all voices should be included because we all have expertise to contribute, but we never know what the, the, the coming contexts are going to require. So as for developing these policies and procedures that you were mentioning, what might you recommend for a company to, to do that? What policies um, to start with, to start implementing or, okay. So I would say companies um, should look at, definitely look at the HRO models. I would say that they should also be highly in tune to the individual needs of their team members and to focus on developing um, them into the best employee they can be. Um, I know that requires a lot of resources, but there, you know, now there's so much opportunity out there um, to learn, even when you're uh, not necessarily uh, receiving training or coaching or developing, it still can happen outside of the organization and volunteering and servicing in your professional organizations like this. So start with whatever your resource whatever resources you have to implement a leadership development program within your within your group um, the professional associations can definitely help you know put it together based on the context of your organization and what you currently have in place but also look at it as an individual mandate an individual um, opportunity to grow and learn um, great. Thank you so much. Um, and I love the idea about the professional associations. A company doesn't have to do it all by themselves. They have these external resources, right? Um, so Alan has another question. Alan, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you while I'm reading it. Um, it says, uh, how about overconfidence? Can a person be too confident? And how do we draw the border between confidence and overconfidence? Alan, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I think it is clear unless it is not clear then I can add more here. Okay. It's not clear. Yeah, that's pretty much called arrogance. Um, <laughs> so we, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, it, it is. I don't know how else to define that. It, it's it's um, sort of turning yourself off to learning and turning yourself off to listening and turning yourself off for being mindful because everything is all of a sudden centered around you. So you want to, when you start to feel yourself, um, I'm the smartest person in the room, sort of thinking and, 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 and related thoughts, uh, you want to, so, so, when, so if it's an inherent arrogance, then I don't know if that's fixable. Um, but if you start to find that it is causing stress and crisis in an organization, um, that self-awareness piece should trigger, should you know, automatically kick in before you go too far. Um, so yes, overconfidence and uh, uh, is a form of arrogance, and an individual should be self, you know, have enough self-awareness to manage themselves before they go too far. Thank you. So can I reflect? Well, <laughs> can I reflect back a little bit on that? Um, 
basically what I was hearing, and I want to make sure I, I understood it, is for you, confidence is not about um, thinking well of yourself as much as it is about humility to have the confidence to allow, to create space for other people. Like you're equating confidence with a sense of humility. Like, Yes, yes, you have to have, um, you have to have this sense of, uh, not charisma, but of gratitude. So, grat you know, confidence without gratitude, that um, it doesn't fit. So confidence and gratitude must go hand in hand. Um, you're very confident about your capabilities and your skill set, but you're also gracious in sharing that and still learning from others. So there's an open door to, um, yeah, humility and gratitude. You have to be a gracious person, you know, to be a confident person. Um, great. So I'm, I'm gonna. So getting to that, um, this kind of goes to George's question. George, I'm gonna unmute you, but she goes. Which one gets more and why, Napoleon or Mr. Rogers? Um, and Georgia, do you want to weigh in on that? No, I was just wondering, do people sit there and be like, I'm a Napoleon style leader that works? Because we, we did the, you know, the Lego serious play and like this one guy who looked like Mr. Rogers, right? He did the Lego play and then he, it was like his experience in Paris and he did like an Arc de Triomphe with like him on top. And we were all like, Okay, that's nice. So I wonder if people are actually honest about things like that. What what were your results? So I didn't hear I didn't hear the the flow of the question, but um, I think the question was when you have a person who sees themselves as one or the other, or who um, behaves as one or the other. How do they manage that? Is that the question? What results did you get when you showed the picture? Did they say yes, I'm a Napoleon leader? Oh, oh yes, they did. And I admit it that I was more of the Napoleon leader, or at least I thought of myself as the Napoleon leader. Um, but how I um, behave towards others is not. So it was two different concepts. And the lesson is, is that both can be effective. The effectiveness is based on the environment that you're in and the individuals that you're working with, you know, the groups that you're in, you must shift between the two. So if you're causing um, a crisis in leadership because you're, you're you know, creating stress and anxiety, that is not effective. Um, whichever approach you use, if you're stressing pe people out as Mr. Rogers or stressing people out as Napoleon, it's the same, it's the same thing. If you are behaving in a way that allows them to feel confident and empowered and that you're able to transfer leadership based on what they need that's the big difference based on what they need you can be either one or you know or the other but it's based on what the other individual needs can i ask a follow-up question of you can sure. you tell me what and i give me your definition of what leadership is your definition of it yes so a leadership is an opportunity um to impart on others the ability to create positive change and positive outcomes. Um, I just think it's an outcomes-based practice. Um, you lead so that you can help others to um, achieve whatever it is that they want, or whether it's an organization as well, um, whatever they want uh, with um, positive influence and outcomes and motivation is also part of that. Um, and Jennifer, this might be a good time. Do you want to remind people about the um, certificates? Yeah, sorry, I was so involved in the conversation, I lost track of time. <laughs> Um, so Humanist Learning Systems, my company, ha is the learning partner. We have approved this session through both HRCI and SHRM. And so if you want a certificate of participation in this program, put it in the chat. I need to know whether you want HRCI, SHRM, and or general certificate. I need your name as you want it on the certificate, and I need the email to send it to you. So you can ask for three certificates, one certificate, two certificates, but there's an HRCI, a SHRM, and a general. 
Okay, great. And I just put that in the type box. So we'll go ahead and get those to you. Um, and to get back to the questions, um, Dr. V, so one of the, some of the questions, the themes that came up in the registration questions were the idea of leadership development, but teaching it at an earlier age, um, either like an elementary school or junior high, high school, and then college. So how could uh, instead of waiting to, to the workplace to develop these skills, is there something that our education system could be doing to help students develop these skills? Yeah, I saw that question and I really liked it because um, I'm very concerned about this focus on self-esteem as opposed to confidence development because they're two totally different things. And research from the Center for Confidence and Wellbeing in the UK has, has this spot on when it comes to helping um, young people to be more confident and to develop confidence so that they can be more productive citizens. And I think that the research uh, I think it's been, it's been about 10 years now since they implemented these policies in, I believe, Scotland schools. Uh, uh, and what they found is that teaching at an early, teaching leadership and teaching confidence at an early age is totally doable when you help these kids to understand that um, it's okay to try and to learn from trying. So again, it's going back to that resilience thing and that confidence development is giving them the power to um, do, act, be um, what they want to be. And self-esteem, um, which is a big thing I think here in the States, uh, is all about, you know, having, you know, feeling that you have value and self-worth, but it doesn't create leaders. It, you know, it creates sort of this dormant type of leader. So what you want to do is to help kids to understand and believe in themselves by practice, by helping them to start practicing, you know, um, overcoming small challenges, small obstacles early on, and what that means in terms of creating self-belief, creating resilience, and trusting themselves and other people. So great. So that sounds a lot to me, or it reminds me of um, Carol Dwyer's The Growth Mindset versus The yes, Fixed I Mindset. Love Yes. And, um, so, so I do think that's a big piece of it is giving people, you know, reframing um, and not making it um, like failure is the, the end of your uh, life. But yes. what about also the relational aspect? Because I, that's come through a lot in your talks is, is, is that I see you, I honor you, I respect you. We don't teach that a lot in our schools. So do you have any um, wisdom you could share on how that could be developed within educational settings? That's a hard one um, because um, I may have a negative aspect of the educational system, but there is hope. Keep you know, there is hope. Um, what I would say is that it's up to you know. Unfortunately, the system itself is not going. It, it, it doesn't have the resources or, or the power to make things change because there are school systems, and I'm talking about U.S. school systems. Um, you, it, there's just too many layers involved with that. So if I had to look at a model, I would look at how teachers are um, taught and uh, how teachers um, are trained to approach students. And I believe that teachers should approach students with this um, sense of empowerment and trust so that they can become more confident kids and that they can become less fearful kids because there's a lot of fear going around in the systems as well. Um, so I would start with the teachers and helping to build a teachable model that empowers teachers to um, support kids in whatever it is they want to do and to build, uh, help them to build confidence and believe in themselves um, by just implementing small, you know, practical models of of um, you know, giving them challenges. And, and when they have these challenges, they go to the next step of, of leadership or confidence development. It's not a passive place though. Again, uh, here in the States, it just seems to be all about self-esteem and that's supposed to all of a sudden generate confidence, um, but encouraging them to be active and engaged and involved um, and how to communicate and talk and trust each other. This is just, it's just too many layers. Yeah. Um, 
And I think that one of the other things I really heard from your presentation was the importance of reflection. So building in the time to um, deconstruct and reflect on what occurred so that you can learn from it. Um, I have my students take the learning organization survey. And the one uh, thing that seems to be across all organizations is the time for reflection is so limited. Um, and so is that that's a culture shift, you know, how can we um, change our organization so that cult, that that time for reflection is is considered to be part of the job and not just frosting or, or a wish list item. Yeah, I agree. Can I um, kind of jump into and there's a question I want to ask that was asked in the, the sign up, but it also relates to what you were just talking about with kids. Um, you know, when I was in grade school, I remember we were explicitly put into teams and had to work collaboratively on our projects. And I ended up being with friends with kids that were, I would not normally be friends with as a result of that. But then we, we, we bring it back into the workplace. If you're a team leader and you have a team member who does not have confidence, how can you help develop them? And this goes into the question we got what do leaders need to do to share power more explicitly so that our team members can have practice um, that you talk about? Yeah, so that is definitely all about building it into the policies, making it transparent and upfront and part of the initial orientation, the initial, um, you know, environmental, uh, you know, entering to that environment so that there's no question about it and that the leaders are there standing up and speaking and attesting to uh, verbally not you know not again one of these internet leaders um, but verbally attesting to how they value it and how it has worked for them and how they hope that you know through these policies and procedures that it will create the environment that they want um, so definitely um, they have to put that into writing as well as practice it and show that they're practicing it. So if, I, if I'm a mid-level manager and my organization is not doing this, how can I do this within my own team? Yeah, within your own team, it's, it's the buy-in from your team members. So you have that conversation with all of your team members and uh, ask them, what do they want? You know, what would you like for this to look like? Um, do you feel we need this? So that is easily, you know, a conversation with the team and asking them first and foremost, you know, what do they want? You know, in your mind, you know, maybe one thing, what they want, maybe something different, they may not want it at all. Um, so asking them what they want and creating um, something around what they all collectively want that will start to create that leadership model that you're looking for. So every leadership model um, doesn't have to start with the same issue or same concern or same parameters. Um, it's created by the members, the team members and the organization and the groups that need it. So that's where the flexibility of the leadership comes in is you ha you take this information you're getting from your team and you adapt to what they what they need adaptability quotient flexibility and adaptability yeah very cool all right so um we're coming to the end just a quick reminder if you want one of the certificates put it in the chat room um and do you have any final thoughts for us dr dunbar this was fun. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am just passionate about changing uh, how we lead and how we look at each other through the lens of leadership and how we treat each other as leaders. Um, so the opportunity to talk about um, high reliability, about um, leading through this new environment of crisis, um, I just appreciate the opportunity. And if anyone has questions, um, by all means, email me or, or um, send me a message through Jennifer and, and I'll be happy to respond. And we will be posting this video on YouTube, but also we're going to take the list of resources that Dr. Dunbar has mentioned throughout this and create a blog post at the International Humanistic Management Association website um, so that it'll all be there and we'll send you all out an email saying here's where it is and here's where the links are. So this has been the Lunch and Learn for the International Humanistic Management Association, and we appreciate you joining us.